Alex is back on the podcast. I figured, Alex, since you are a founder and have been a founder and are a founder, you're doing this multiple times. I'm starting to worry about you. <laughs> <laughs> we brought intervention. That's, this uh, is an intervention. Lots of coffee and beer. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Intervention. So I figured that you would have a unique insight into something that I don't see being discussed a lot. There's a, a lot of people writing a lot of articles about you got to have evidence to make decisions. You got to tie your things back to evidence. There's frameworks, there's OKRs. And then there is a founder's intuition for what we should do. Basically, a discussion about intuition led products or initiatives versus evidence based. So I, I started to watch this episode on Amazon Prime Blue Bloods, right? I mean, so. You got to, sorry, Tom Selleck's mustache is the best I've ever seen. But, you know, one of the things in there is detective work. And detective work is all, you prove the case by evidence, but you get the evidence by intuition. And a lot of it is gut feel. A lot of it is intuition that's beyond belief. And the best detectives, according to that show, are the ones with a lot of intuition. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, once things get in the court, it's a little bit different. It's more procedural. And I have a feeling that we're just kind of listening to a lot of people just talk a lot about sort of being Captain Obvious and uh, saying the popular stuff. Like, oh, somebody said this. And, and if you notice LinkedIn, one person has one subject and all of a sudden that's like scattered all over in the same subject okay. is being propagated all throughout the ecosystem. And in reality, when you when you think about it in, in the bigger picture, it's just a small slice of a, of a big discipline. And, and I kind of feel like here, it's the same thing. You can't have one without the other. You know, you start out with some kind of an assumption. You have no data. You have to place a bet, make a decision, explore, learn, make mistake. Once you find an opportunity, you try to wrap it around metrics. You try to place some kind of assumptions. And after that, you have some kind of a way to evolve mm -hmm. the idea, the model, etc. I think people are just discounting the gut feel for no apparent reason because there is a play in both. I can immediately think of a reason in my day-to-day -day work in product management because I, I will often struggle with this category because I have a strong intuition only because I've seen a lot of products marketed to, uh, marketed to and serving a lot of different audiences, right? I have experience, but I can't imagine how someone would do that job and figure out what evidence they need to guide them in what direction without the experience and that's that 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 is my concern in this category is there's people out there that say oh we have to look for evidence we need every every objective needs a key result we're going to make up a, a dozen key results for every single objective well you know as alex was saying at the beginning you have no data you have an idea that you want to pursue right so you got to go with that idea or alternate ideas but you got to go with an idea and pretty quickly there back it up with here's what we what we thought it would do and here's what it's actually done and, and look at the delta ultimately it's all about reducing the options right based on data that you observe so do something observe get data reduce options meaning don't pursue those things that are not likely to be successful based on the data you received i think you just reverse engineered uh, google's uh, whole whole plan for building products is uh, observe what someone's doing in, in their market build a slice of what they did observe how it goes and then uh, reduce just, your just options that. build a little more reduce your options until you've taken over someone else's market with something that completely wasn't original in the first hey, place i think there's truth in that i don't think they should be <laughs> pushing things out to market so fast they've learned from that well, um, I, I actually have a question here for Brian. So do you feel that experience is what gives you a better control of your gut feel? Or do you feel that being more open-minded and having less exposure in the area that you're trying to make a decision for something like that is more susceptible? What clearly is emerging in my mind is I, I would not trust someone who is not just generally a curious person. Yeah, but you know, but to, does does experience give you better chances of placing the right bet? Maybe because How, I, quantify that. I, I've also been coupled with people who are experienced that just make some terrible choices. Okay, oh. so 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 we have if we look at evidence based, so we have evidence of successes. We have 
some evidence of failures, but not as many because people don't talk about failures as much. So for every success, it's like, oh, they knew it. They came up with metrics. They were this brilliant. So you have like this vision of perfection. Then you have failures that you don't hear about where people place wrong bets and not succeed or pick wrong metrics. So I think we're so skewed on the success based that we recognize when the value is there but we sort of don't actually have the comparison ratios or metrics to tell you when you failed going with the same approach. I see where you're going with that. I, I think if you don't have a at least familiarity, I was going to say background, but that suggests some depth there. If you don't have familiarity with the domain in which you're working and placing these bets, the odds are kind of against you a little bit there because you're shooting in the dark, right? You're basically rolling the dice and hopefully if you roll enough, then yeah, some, some, some of them will come out good. And sometimes you're too close to the problem and you need an outside yes. opinion. True. So yes. you actually need somebody that has no idea about the, this given market, has a completely different perspective, and is able to surface something that you've been staring at for years and years. It's a fair point. I think that's a fair point. Maybe the right approach might be to don't do it single-handedly, right? Just make sure that you have that other input from someone who is not in your domain. A lot of people that I've interacted with who hire product managers, they will say, I would rather have someone who has domain expertise, someone who has familiarity with the domain rather than an outsider, which just seems to counteract what, like it seems to be the counterpoint to what you're saying, Alex. So I, I want someone who is outside of my industry because they can observe what we're doing from the outside. And there's no sacred ground in here. They're gonna ask questions everywhere to, to kind of expose maybe our assumptions that we've taken for granted. So good question is there a right approach? And the answer to that question is, I don't think so. I think a lot of it is superficial in many ways, and it depends. I mean, look, look, at, it, look at it from this perspective. Let's imagine there's a company hires somebody who's never been a product manager, somebody who's just a subject matter expert in one area, and, but they have a drive, and they have a certain creativity to them, and a certain persona, and then they're able to build something. That person's going to get elevated in status as a result of achieving something, going to look brilliant, going to be that hero, right? And all of a sudden, that's going to be the new norm. Hey, let's pick somebody that's, that's not a part of this industry, and they're going to come in with this wild set of ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it's the bias of the organizations trying to find the talent right. based on what they interpret to be the more likely chance of success. So if you were a product manager previously, are you more positioned to be as successful as a product manager? What's the basis of that experience? What's the behavior telling you? Yeah. And I think early in my career, I came across an investor, Paul Martino, and he said something that the best achievements are done by people who have a history of achieving great things. Mm -hmm. And that resonates strong. So if somebody has a history of great results, they're probably in the more position to achieve those same results. But it has nothing to do about the approach. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So if someone has a background in, in our example, product management, even though they don't have domain experience in the new domain they're working in, they have a higher chance of being successful because they have experience as a product manager. Is that what we're saying? If they've achieved great things previously, yeah, they, yes, that's what they, I'm they, so you know, they you get can, hired for that, right? Yeah, you can, you can, you can drop them off in a you know uninhabited island with you know with uh, a pocket knife, and they'll build you a mall, like right, right, right out of that Harrison Ford movie. Right. You know, so yes, there are people that will create something out of nothing, just sheer by their grit and their knowledge, and you know, I don't know how much of it is approach, but it's. I, I think there are some things as more smarts. I so, think drive, perhaps, and ambition might have something to do with it too, right? Uh, what, what I'm hearing from the conversation is I'm hearing you want someone with leadership ability, but also the ability to craft and communicate a vision. Like, regardless of what that is, you know, like drop them in a brand new industry. They're naturally curious people, they have some leadership talent. And they have the ability to craft a vision based off of what they're saying and the willingness to change their outlook when presented with new evidence. I guess I'm already gravitating to the middle. I'm, I'm already gravitating to the moderate of this. I don't, and I, and I got to tell you, I don't like it. I really want to be on one side of this uh, argument. Uh, well, let's uh, pick a side and prove you wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, the, I mean, the, the, the team alignment and vision, if I'm a leader in the organization and, and I say, okay, uh, this is the vision, this is what we're shooting for, right? you know, like everyone get on the same page. The better leaders in the organization will obviously gravitate to like, well, why? Why why this big change in direction? I bring that up to express my gripe about OKRs. 
the way that I've seen them implemented everywhere I've been, which is the objective is like a couple layers above where the teams are at and the KRs, the teams will just like throw a dozen things out there that I think will make management happy. And now we forget about half of them through the re- through the rest of the year, through, through the end of the year. And then at the end of the year, it's like, t- tell me everything you did to, to your KR. It's like, I don't remember. We did that in January. I don't remember any of that. You they, know what I mean? It's like, they're not it's, doing that right then. If that's how they're doing it, they're not doing uh, it right. Uh, They've not been implemented very well, widely, right? And the other thing is people often conflate um, OKRs with KPIs. So they say one thing, they mean another, or they kind of mix everything up, right? They need to be clear. They need to be clear about what we're, because one's a leading indicator and the other can be leading or lagging, depending on how you Mm. implement it. I have this vision every time somebody brings up the word of the OKR. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I I close my eyes and I visualize a chart. And on that chart, I want to see those metrics that are identified in the OKR. And that chart may show that we're at zero right now, or it might show a little bit of a uptick in something. And I want to see that actually start growing in a certain direction based on our assumption. I wouldn't say growing, maybe changing Mm -hmm. in a certain direction. And I think you're right about the lagging indicators. If you're comparing, if you're driving the OKR before you implemented something, then nothing's going to move till you're done. That's number one. Number two, only after you're done and you've delivered something, can you actually start taking advantage of it? But that's not where things start. Do you have to teach anybody on anything you've just built out? Is it automatic? Is there a product marketing plan? Is there ads? I mean, what's the OKR based on? And it could it could be a year before you see an uptick. I think a lot of times the OKRs people make for a short-term goal, but they're a really long-term indicator. Right, yeah. That's been exactly what my experience is. What are we gonna do in the short term for this long-term thing? Like, do we get to choose them? Are you writing? KRs for us because I, I like I don't know I read the book that's not the way it's supposed to work it's this thing that's supposedly so easy that if I just read on LinkedIn they'll tell me how easy it is but in actuality like people mess it up all the time that the leading versus lagging indicator conversation that is super interesting to me because a lot of time when people are looking for metrics all the metrics that they come up with are lagging indicators if i am lobbying to launch a new product i've lobbied for budget i've lobbied to have developers split off from their teams for a period of time and leadership is probably checking in with me minimum of every week i need leading indicators so i can go to my team and pivot and change things before my end of week review with with management where I ask for more money or the, I, I try to convince the management people that are already kind of on the fence. When I pitch the idea that we're doing good, there is good signal, keep funding the project. I'm trying to convince them. So I need good solid leading indicators and, and I, I feel all I have in a, a typical environment is lagging indicators. Well, so, so, so the real example, let's say you have a, a multi-step functionality that you're developing, right? Mm-hmm. And you actually have a small slice that you could do and based on the small slice, you're immediately getting the feedback, yeah. right? And that small slice could be, hey, click here if you'd be interested to see this. And people are like clicking this nonstop, giving you indicator that, hey, lots of folks wanna wanna do this. And yeah. you just give them a pop out and go, thanks. You just voted right. that this is the next thing we're gonna deliver. Right. Or you start engaging conversation. The problems a lot of times is if you ask people that whether they want it, a lot of times we'll just say yes. They don't actually tell you no. Uh, absolutely. And so you could you could easily fall into the wrong trap. Absolutely. That's the wrong question too, in my opinion though. Do you want it? Sure. You know. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's gonna right. say no. Right. So what problem will this help you solve? And then have them provide feedback. Maybe structured, right? Maybe give them a, a list of things they can choose from. I think to me that's a better that's a better data point than just simply saying, do you want this? Right. So okay. is the leading indicator essentially some kind of a survey that people answer but it's positioned in a way that it's open-ended questions about hey what keeps you up at night type, sure. of, those type of stuff i think so I, I think it is and the the actual indicator piece of it might be putting this survey out if we get more than fill in the blank 20 percent of people saying it's going to solve this problem for them then we'll pursue it in that direction yeah. if it's this other problem We'll consider that, right, and pursue in that direction. Right. But now we're actually going, leaning more not towards the gut feel, but towards the metric based. Correct. Right. But these are leading indicators. We're not waiting a year to do this. It's like looking at a, a navigation map, right? Let's say you're going 30 miles from here, and you don't wait till you travel 30 miles to see if you came down the right track. You're you're checking street by street. Are we going the right way? Right. 
That's yeah. what you're doing. You can, so you can pivot. Right? Yeah. Maybe there's a traffic jam and the thing diverts you around, but you're still looking. Am I basically going north? Yeah. And I'm understanding that's arguing agile, but also I don't I don't mind us settling on a balance approach. You need people on your team looking out for both, but you need a balance depending on where your product market fit is, depending on where your team maturity is, depending on where your organizational maturity is, depending on if the founders are still in your organization or if they're gone. Where in the product cycle you are. Where, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In those different phases, you need more of one or the other. Well, you need you need a continuous flow of experiments. And the problem is you need a backlog of experiments of things that you want to test out. Yeah. Right. And hopefully those experiments are not just the, uh, you know, uh, just wild guesses without monetization and plan. Right. So there has to be some kind of a results that you want to drive. I like where you're going. And I especially like it because most product management is not there. I would expect that it is an alien concept to a lot of the people of here's my team's board where we work on stuff. We pull cards in, but also I have an experiment lane that says these are the things that we're trying, different things that you're trying to do. Other things that we talk about sometimes on the podcast is an experiment with how you're trying to evolve your teams. We had a retrospective, our organization, all the developers, like the lead developer assigns work out to the individual developers and we want to try peer programming now. Like we were like, was somebody read an XP book or a blog or something? And we want to try peering. I said, I, 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 I put my PR in the mail and send it to somebody. And then like a week or two later, somebody gets around to my PR or whatever. Maybe this time we want to just peer and sit together. And then it just goes straight in. Just see how, just say how it works and see if we're comfortable with it. Why don't we try that experiment on the team in the team? Like yeah. that, th those, those types of experiments, I think the same thing is like experimenting with a product in the field, like if you want to do a fake door test, for example, you were describing, uh, like those never make it into the backlog. They never make it onto a board. So as an engineer, if, if something comes over that talks about pair programming or within development process that we just want to try it, my answer is don't tell me about it, just try it. You know, what you should do is you should just come, come back to me and say, hey, we've did it, nobody knew about it. It wasn't like an initiative. The, pro the problem about making those things clear that we are doing this, there's a, there, there's a certain success factor right that you're kind of like a hidden message oh it better succeed right because nobody likes oh, it, yeah, likes to fail point. so just just do it and come back to it and go you know what i had a chance to sit with such and such and work with, together with them and guess what i found i found that this big pr that i was working on i didn't have to do we resolved everything in instantaneously and i guess it would have taken us at least three four days to do the same thing in a synchronous way and we were just able to close it and finish it all right let's maybe on the small things, we want to have them reviewed, but maybe on the big ones, we come together as a team, right? right? And these types of discussions, they're always possible. I think, I think where, we, where we fall in the trap is all the time we're trying to create a concrete process around it. Mm -hmm. like, like, let's stop doing the process. Let's, let's solve a problem one at a time whenever it comes up. I think that works well if a team is self-organizing. They just do it, right? Especially if they're not being micromanaged. But what I found is often the teams are just going to do what they're basically told to do they're not self-organizing and in that case I, I think what brian was saying may make sense have a board to track experiments we used to actually do that have a flip chart in the room that said this is our current experiment and our rule as a team was we don't try more than one at a time because we don't know how the, these two experiments interplay with one another but we try it and the mindset was we'll try it we're not instituting a new process what we're doing is we're trying this for a sprint to see how it works. Mm -hmm. If it works well, continue for a sprint until it becomes habit. Or if it really doesn't work well, just kill it. Why don't keep it going? Devil's advocate stance. Uh, how many times did Edison mess around with a light bulb before it worked? Yeah, 10,000 or whatever okay. it was. So if you try it in one sprint and it didn't work, do you try it again and adjust based on the factors? I think it's a like? way of getting the team on board with the idea yeah. of trying the experiment. Even if it works a little bit, no one's going to say, hey, that sucks because the evidence points against that. It says, well, it worked, right? right. Let's just try more of it. Figure right. out why it didn't work well, better. I pivoted this example because I wanted to point out not a lot of people are tracking their own team's improvement and work. When you bubble up to the business of like, I'm exploring this strategy. Think about it. I, I'm exploring the strategy and I want to see if there's signal. Think about it. If you're using, if you're using a system to track your tickets, you could be using any system. It could be any, it could be project simple. It could be a system that uh, sucks like your, like it could be, <laughs> could be any system. But uh, if you're, if you're using a system to track your work on, how do I know that committing to start working on an Epic is valuable to my customers? That, I, that I'm the business owner at this point. 
and I'm asking my product manager who's saying, okay, I, I finished Epic X. I'm gonna start an Epic Y next week. It's gonna be great. We're gonna knock it out. And then after that, we got Epic Z lined up. It's all ready to go. Or Epic Z, depending on where you're listening. It's Z. <laughs> <laughs> Only in America. Well, there we Z. go. That's it. That's, you heard it here first. Only in America. <laughs> As a business owner, I'm gonna ask, how did you set these priorities? How do you know that it's X and then Y and then Z? Well, the, got, sa got the safer answer there, safe with capital Oh, SIS. no, not a, not a no. You create an LBC, a lean business case for every epic that says, here's what we want to do. Here's the target market. Here's the rough size of it, therefore cost. Here's how many customers are impacted, et cetera, confused. et cetera. <laughs> right? And, and then you evaluate each of them against each other and make a decision. I, I, I don't know. It sounds very procedural to it me. Is. And uh, sorry, coming in from an entrepreneurship side, I just, you know, I think it's a lot of trying to manage an ideal process and coming up with all these things that sometimes you just got to jump, jump in. And, and yeah, and, and, and you do have to do that. And a lot of times you have to do it without telling anybody that you're doing it right there's there's so many ways that you can skew the direction of the experiment right by people knowing about it i like where you're going with this one because this is this is normally when i push back on the category of being evidence-based and we talked about before the podcast we talked about the uh, brian chesky where he's like oh we we don't have product managers anymore or we're gonna let marketers do that and we're gonna pay for only one position and then what i don't know no. I, I don't know judging by me knowing the app and struggling with the app, I'd say that the product organization just didn't really succeed in they building together a vision that was easily right. Well, it, it looked like a lot of siloed things glued together, right. that's and exactly that's right. that's why the reorg or a new quote unquote vision. But in essence, what it does, it brings the entire power under one one person's control and eliminates all of the variability. But good question whether that's going to improve anything because you've, you're you're basically eliminating ownership. And we kind of had right. discussions of the ownership one time well, ago. Well, you, you're in, well, in that case, the banner you're eliminating ownership under is a very large banner of, yeah, but I can make decisions quickly. I don't need a lot of evidence and I don't need a lot of, I'm your founder. I can, I can just make the call. Just, which is your gut feel which again. Is, which is my gut feel. It's a rebalancing in the company. Again, we're just talking about Airbnb in this example. And we can talk about them because we did a whole podcast on them. You can go listen to the Airbnb podcast that we did. And that was the call. The call was, we had all these product managers. We felt like we were losing control. And I wanted to make a push to centralize decision making through me. The one roadmap had to come through me and everything cycled through me. That was that. That's the decision yeah. that they made. Yeah. A real decision. Yeah. And other companies do something similar, but it doesn't necessarily fall under the founder so much. There's this new thing that I've seen lately, lately, the last few years. Yeah. Chief innovation officer. Or, or the word real? innovation's in there somewhere in their title, is right? That real? Is these people, apparently it's real. So what, what do these people do? I mean, what, what is their charter? They're innovating, supposedly. Well, they're, they're trying to bring in a lot of solutions together and see how they benefit the existing business or product or things like that. You know, so I think, I think we've touched up on something very interesting and in product that comes up a lot. So we have somewhat of a conflicting state between community-based creativity where we all come together we brainstorm we all agree on things we all get each one of our ideas and everybody's brilliant and we glue it all together and voila something magical happens and then we have the alternative which is it's one person's vision and that person knows best and he needs everybody just to fall in and trust him and there are opportunities for both of these right it depends on the culture, it depends what you're building, yeah. depends how you're supporting. I think it's extremely tough to bring together a team of all stars where everybody's just coming in with all these brilliant ideas. They need to have a certain type of success and experience to come together. When I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking like Ocean's 13 or something like, you know, and, and vice versa. You have one person that's able to invent things from the get go or maybe not even invent, but tie it together from a lot of in independent inventions or independent uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. And those are different cultures. Do There's a continuum of cultures between those two, probably, mm -hmm. right? And we only hear about those successes in retrospect. If tomorrow, you know, there's a brilliant five-man team that comes up with like some kind of a magical quantum computer AI that's able, able to do generative AI and like, you know, on the shoestring budget on yeah. the little phone, that is going to be like, oh my God, these guys are brilliant, but you know, 
that's going to be a new approach that's popularized. Mm -hmm. So I think we're popularizing things and we're arguing about individual points of view. I don't think there is a perfect product manager. Yeah. I, I also think the yeah. product manager is a senior role. It's not a junior role, you know, and it's not even the one that you can you can comfortably sit into after a few years of being a developer. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it takes a lot of knowledge. I think it takes at least three years to become an expert in any given market. And the domain experience means a lot. You need somebody completely fresh, completely un unbound with that specific market, and you need a fresh perspective. Yeah. And, and I don't know if there's a perfect answer. I think there's probably a blend in there. There's a little more risk involved when you get somebody brand new, you know, and to weigh in, especially if they're, if they're a heavy influencer. Uh, let me put it that way. Let's talk about coaches. Sure. Sports, right? Mm -hmm. How many times were there great coaches for a team that never even played that sport, right? And winning leagues and trophies and all that stuff. And how many times very experienced players became coaches and couldn't do a thing? Right. Yeah, that's Dif a great example. Different skill example. sets, right? They're different skill sets. That's a great example because in agile coaching, a lot of people will use that example to say, no, you need to have participated in order to be a great coach. You need to have, have been a developer in order to be a great coach of development teams. That's a big point of contention. So I have a story. Obviously, some people know that I play table tennis. Well, not anymore, but I used to. I used to get very, very good, coached kids and a whole bunch of stuff. And when I went out to learn it, I came out to look for a coach. There were coaches that were extremely, extremely good. Ex-players, top-notch, yep. world-class, and tons of kids would line up to practice with them. Time after time, they're playing with this very advanced coach, growing very slowly. Meanwhile, I found a coach who was self-taught, didn't even look like a coach. You know, big belly, barely moved, right? I mean, and there you have athletes that are like world-class. And his students, all of them improved one after the other. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you, what's the secret? And the secret is one, the very advanced coaches forgot what it's like to be a beginner, forgot what it's like to grow, forgot mm -hmm. what it's like to change. They only advanced, they applied advanced technique and it was all repetition and skill, which they already had, but they, they forgot how to get there. Meanwhile, my coach, remembered clearly yep. and instead he understood biomechanics he could explain very succinctly how to change something mm. he he focused on strategy on results on tactics very very different he could tell every step of the way so i just go that you know you don't have to be the most experienced person or and still rely on them to be successful yep. sometimes it takes more other talents like observation like ability to figure things out you know grit you name it I think that's true of coaches. I, I think when you when you wear a different hat, like if you're mentoring somebody, you better know what you're talking about. So you should have experience in it and come from the standpoint of, in my experience, this has worked or this hasn't worked. But if you're coaching, there's a lot of soft skills that come into play. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily the domain knowledge, right? I'm glad we hit on this vein in the podcast. I'm sorry, I'm going to monologue for a second, but I'm glad we hit on this vein because I want to talk about it in terms of what we've already brought up, which is you know, it's old Airbnb, he went on a hike and he, he saw this vision and it's like suddenly 10 years later, he didn't know what happened and then he woke up in the woods. One pair of pants later. I, I think he probably found out that he was not, as a leader, he was not a very good coach. So he brought on these product managers and found out that they couldn't follow with the same intuition that he had or they couldn't understand the business the way that he understood it. The point I'm trying to make is, well, if I could sit down with him and say, well, let's examine your self-professed failure in this. Let's sit down and pick it apart. And I'd like to dissect and figure out why this failure happened. If you peel the product management position way back to its roots, like it's a Yahoo and whatever, Mozilla or whatever it was, like Marty Kagan roots of a GM in disguise as a product manager, but it's really just the person you're running your business that doesn't own your business, but they're running your business and we're gonna give them a new title. If it's that kind of position, now it makes it pretty clear, well, I need to tr train that person to take over for me, the business owner. I need you to run my business. Here's all the things I need you to learn. And, and quick, I'm gonna write a laundry list of a million things that are impossible for you to learn all at once. So you gave me a great, ex you gave me a great title of a future podcast, which is building the perfect 
product manager. What does the educational track of a perfect product manager look like? It, and experience track. It, and succession planning, right? From the point of view of the, the business owner, who are they going to bring in? I mean, you don't just show up one day and say, tomorrow I'm going to go sail my yacht and pick somebody and go, you have a pulse. You're now yeah. the product manager. Well, you take over from me. You can't well, really do that. You know, the, the funny thing about this category is well, enter your scrum training now into the picture. And they're saying, well, the product owner role, you can delegate that to people. You can just take 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 people doing a normal job. Like let's say um, Brian and Oma's development company. We're in the business of I don't even know what business we would be in. We're we're in the business of I was gonna say selling yachts, but that I don't know anything about selling yachts. It's okay. <laughs> Go on to your intuition. We're we're <laughs> Brian and Oma's software development company. We're gonna tap we're gonna tap people that know more junior people in the business to do product owner roles for vertical segments. Okay, you're we're selling yachts now at Brian and Oma's software development company. I don't know why I like a it. software development like company it. selling yachts. I have no idea. So. We're writing software for yachts now. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to make you the product owner for navigation systems. And I have another guy that I'm going to make them the product owner for, I don't know. Engine know, systems. Engines. And I'm tapping junior people. Maybe they know how to write software very well. They don't know anything about the yacht industry or the customers or whatever. And I'm saying, well, go out and learn. Because I went through a two-day training and now I understand, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know where I'm going yeah. with this, right? Like, exactly I exactly you. where you're going with this now. Yeah. You, you don't have enough depth either way. I mean, if it takes three years to become an expert right those two that two days is not going to do anything as a matter of fact the only thing is going to turn into a backlog manager there's not going to be an original thinking there's going to be a lot of confusion and so you need to evolve that person under under a very experienced mentor yeah and based on role you're right about the depth i think it's true of uh, breadth as well if you've only ever experienced things in one company in one way for three years that still doesn't make you an expert you don't know what you don't know I go back in time all the time, and I'm kind of going back to the roles of a business analyst. Sure. You know, uh, business analyst used to be a very decent, respectable position. In certain respects, it's still still around, just not as widely populated, especially in software. And I think that role is essentially morphed into more of a product management role, but there's a different connotation to it. Business analyst was not decision maker. Business analyst was gathering a lot of points, bringing the data together in order to drive a decision, uncover a bunch of things, flush out stuff, become an expert in the market, right. and be the advisor to the decision-making body. Right. But instead, what we did is we turned into a product management role, and product management role, by definition, is entitled to make decisions. So here we are, getting a much more junior role filled under a wrong title, give them the ability to make decisions, and then we wonder when it doesn't go Why the right way, right? And Brian, again, like to piggyback off what you were saying about a startup. So I'm in a space right now. I do cannot see myself hiring a product manager. Why? Because I have a certain type of vision and I don't think anybody will have that certain type of vision. I got to at least realize it to 80% or something like that. And only then can I bring somebody in and, and tell them what the rest of the vision looks right. like, but I got to give them the core. Right. If I don't do that, nobody's ever going to have the same thought process. Can somebody yeah. help me? Yes. But they shouldn't run it for me. Right. They should be my advisor, my confidant in a way, right? Somebody who's working with me, but in maybe maybe we're doing things together in certain respects, right? But it's it wouldn't be a role of a product manager. Yeah. And I, I, and I will tell you, I've, I've been in this position two times in my career. And the, the only other person that I've ever met that has, been, that has been in the position an equal number of times has been Tricia, who's been on the podcast before, who's been in this position where they the company brings her in, whether a permanent employee or on contract, as the first product manager to separate the product job from the founder of the company. The working relationship you have to have with that person is that person has to finish your, I was going to say finish your sandwiches. That person has to finish your sentences. And maybe sandwiches. <laughs> and sandwiches. Then maybe sandwiches. I mean, yeah. you, have, you have to be talking so often because they, they have to seamlessly pull out the vision out of your head and then start running with it and then be okay when you want to drop in and adjust the vision a little bit and say, okay, I got it now going to run with that right away have no problem there's no ego involved usually it doesn't happen until the founder gets so busy they, they have to admit to themselves that they can't be in all these places at the same time the company's grown to a certain point that that's when they bring in somebody but- i was i was on the other side of that about oh god maybe five years ago i was invited to be a ceo of a company about you know 12 people yeah they were making good money and they were two technical founders they weren't growing as fast as they wanted to and they realized that they need, you know, somebody else to lead them. Yeah. Their competition was selling f- 
you know, got, just got acquired for a big amount of money. And here they are, you know, with a better product kind of struggling. And I come in to work with the two founders and I said, I'm not going to take the CEO role. Let me at least take, you know, your biggest week as the marketing. Let me take the in interim uh, CMO position and work with you guys to figure out if this is going to be a, a fit. And we worked together for about nine months and eventually we parted ways mm -hmm. because I couldn't pull away that baby and make them think differently. Right. I couldn't let go what they were used to to create a different vision. Yeah. And unfortunately, that's going to happen a lot of times because the founder is so caught up in it every day. It's hard to pull that away. Sure. Can you build that relationship? Yes, you can't rush it. And that's why actually we talked about this before. After the acquisition, what happens to a lot of companies? They fall apart. Why? Vision is gone. That and a little bit of the incentive for the employees sticking around, right? But, but how do you maintain that? I think what you're saying is specifically true if the founders are technical themselves and they came up with a solution from the ground up. Like this is the product that I've built, it's my baby, right? It's, it's true in that scenario where they find it very difficult to let go. Even even letting go, not in terms of the day to day or the, the running of the company. I'm talking about just the vision. This is how it is, mm, and you will follow my vision. I feel this kind like the conversation we're having now. Like we can see the reason to have a blend of the two. But I can tell you, I've been at companies where like your manager or somebody in leadership, or CTO, comes down and says like, uh, "Oh, I, I know what to do. We we need to do this. I don't care what the evidence says. I know we need to do this." And I say. Well, how do you know? What makes you think that's that's the case, right? I, I mean, they, they, yeah. They, right. I just came back from a conference. So there is a interesting thing. There's a blog post somewhere about all of the products that Apple failed at. And actually, there's a post for all of the famous companies, the products they failed at. Yeah. And you take a look at and it's like, oh, my God, you can't believe how many silly solutions people came up with. Yeah. And everybody had a dream and it just burned. Like the computer museum, let's say in, in Mountain View, has a lot of these examples of mm -hmm. things that just popped up briefly and disappeared. And I think we, we just forget to talk about these things, the mistakes that happen, right? Like Google is getting hit right now very, very hard with you know their AI, right? Sorry. And screwing that up. You know, Apple had products that failed miserably. Including and, the car. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of those were gut feels. There wasn't anything right. to test for. I mean, right. and even the things that succeeded, right? They were gut feels. Sure. How, how'd you know that the, the iPhone would succeed? It was a great indication. Personally, I couldn't understand the screen back then the way I do now, right? So, but it, it could have went another way. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I, even in a space where, in, in that last example, uh, iPhone, I mean, there were phones around, right? They just made a, a, a phone with a single screen and this and that. But right. even outside of that, there are examples of successes, even though they're sporadic, I guess, you know, where there was no market. And somebody came out with this wacky idea and it succeeded somehow. But for every one of those, you can bet there are hundreds if not thousands that didn't work. Mm. Let's talk about the the pet rock or, <laughs> or, or, or you know what I'm saying? Oh, These loves are ridiculous. Loves pet rock. I love it. I love pet yeah, rock. Yeah, you just sell a rock. That's right. sell a piece of, yeah. yeah. The little plush toys with those big eyes in yeah. every single supermarket that my kids can't get past. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a hundred of them at home. It's like, come on, not one more. I know what you're talking about. You know, and it's ridiculous. <laughs> you just keep on buying it. I don't understand I almost it. feel like you should make those little eyes illegal. You know? they, these companies made real money. You bet there was not a whole lot of data, but they might have done some initial testing, sure, or maybe not, right? Just come up with something and see how it sticks. And you could get lucky occasionally. Uh, it's I not mean, a strategy, though. I want to dig into the iPhone example because the iPhone example, it seems like a big bang risk of like, we're going to develop this interface and all this hardware and all this stuff. And then the apps and they like, it can't even make a phone call. It's like the, the original buyers are going to buy it, even though it can't make a phone call. You know, it's there seems to be a lot of risk in that category, but they I like I don't know what the I don't know the timeline of the original iPhone. I probably should research this. Probably it's probably worth researching because I wonder how long between the first demo, the the first time that they let the world know that they had it until they actually allowed you to buy it. I wonder how long they had it until then. Because that 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 marketing buzz, like right now what you would do is you'd, you'd put out your press release or your marketing campaign or whatever you want to call it, and then you would measure the online people talking about your product. Mm -hmm. Like you do your social media analysis or whatever. And if the buzz is constant, you know the fervor is holding constant, you know there's a demand. 
So you, you, whatever you put out in your initial one, any additional features you promise would be just icing on the cake, Great. right? Yeah, yeah. Let alone, well, you can't even make, you can't really make phone calls. <laughs> it's advertising making phone calls, but I mean, uh, version two point uh, maybe. So Apple made a lot of bets and they lost a lot. Yeah, yeah. you know they've picked the, the the desktop versions that were just nobody was buying. I mean, they they got into education and that was keeping them afloat. Otherwise, they'd disappear yeah. a lot earlier. Yeah. And uh, it worked. Yeah. It worked. It sustained them enough to grow. Yeah. But the the, the the dangerous part of this one, and I think you you brought this up early in the podcast, Alex, about like, well, the people posting on LinkedIn about examples or whatever. They're not highlighting all the examples. Like the Airbnb podcast, we, I, I hate to keep going back to one example, but the Airbnb podcast, like there are very few examples where you have someone inside the company exposing, well, we only do two big releases or three, I can't remember, per year. But they are iterating and they're creating new features, but they're holding them all. They're holding them all internally. They're testing them, right? And they may they may even have like beta users or whatever, but they're holding the GA release. They're holding the main release of their application until they can have a big marketing PR frenzy, basically. Apple did the same thing. They're doing it now. I mean, they have iOS has beta releases. Yeah, but the, the but they don't wait for a year. The right? problem with that is they will put it out there once it's good enough. But you don't get to see you, the consumer. You do not. You are not exposed to their failures because they're doing marketing that way. But also, like, not a lot of companies can afford to say, "Well, we only release twice a year." Twice a year, right? Even if their core product is bad, right? They still like Airbnb, for example. But yeah, so, you're right. So I, I, I think there is no perfect answer here. And I sure. think a lot of it is it depends. If you're genuinely building something new, because I mean, there are different solutions out there, right? Mm -hmm. If you're building something com completely new or maybe just very different from what exists, you don't really have a lot of data go by. Mm -hmm. And even when you collect the data, some of it is going to be biased. You could get a wrongful confirmation bias, depending how you position the questions. Mm. You can try very hard not to create the questionnaires that are going to be formed in a way to suggest an answer, but that's even hard. And eventually, the data that you receive, how much are you going to trust, right? Are you going to go against the right audience? What if you test the same thing in a different market, all right, and find out that things are different. I mean, how many times the product was wronged very poorly for a given market. And similarly, if you're implementing something that's pretty well known, but you'd like to get a better, easier, lightweight, more reliable version of something, then you don't really need a lot of testing and evidence because that could be assumed. So I think whenever you're coming up with something, you need to ask yourself a question. Is what we're building that important that we need to validate it first? Or are we comfortable taking the risk? Yeah, and sometimes that'll come down to the size of the investment you're making. You know, if it's just a small investment, then just go ahead and do it mm -hmm. and count it as some cost if it doesn't work out. If it's a large investment, then your CFO is not likely to nod up and down, right? So you have to carry them with you. I take another dimension. It's also impact to the reputation and the business. Oh, definitely. Right? Because definitely. you can make a small investment on something, change yeah. it, blow up customer service, sure. yeah. get beat up, yeah. you know, and that's going to, that can have yeah, a, you're absolutely a, a right. very, very yeah. big uh, impact. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that you called out, Alex, that I really wanted to dig into, I don't know how, how deep I want to dig into this one of like data can be manipulated. Or at least misinterpreted, or right? like it's like misinterpreted accidentally, but oh, I've told, willfully. I've, yeah, told, okay. I've told stories on this podcast. It could be positioned in a way that's more favorable to yes. drive a certain yes. result. Yes, I have, told, and nobody will ever know because they're looking at a PowerPoint. Exactly, exactly. I've told stories on this podcast before about a certain individual who owned all of the stats, and you had to go to that individual, and so, they would they would throw out stats that were not favorable to their department. And I, like, I, I've told that story before. I think the same thing about this is, if you're gonna show the data that leads you to judge things as successes or not, you know, leading indicators basically, it needs to be transparent and open for anyone to go look at it. But whether they will or not, that's that's a different, you know. So, so, like, so like four out of five doctors recommended, but four of those doctors are obstetricians, right? <laughs> Not dentists. Yeah, yeah. right? I, I think what that may look like in practice is being transparent with everyone about the whole process. Like, How do you go about data collection? What questions you asked? You know, what was the population that was surveyed? If you're transparent about that, then I think the other person has more 
reason to believe in you you have more credibility let me put it that way mm -hmm. as opposed to here's the data the data shows right boom like you see on tv commercials often and somewhere there's some small print but they never leave it up on the screen long enough for you to read it yeah that's a typical a typical american problem right there yeah, it's like, here's the fine print typical oh you problem can't in a very large litigious society too, aka too late. america too late it's true. That's data can be manipulated. Data can be misrepresented. Right. Data can be collected erroneously. You name it. All right. Well, again, transparency, accountability, like those are the, that's the pill for solving that chronic disease right there. I can't claim that I'm evidence-based and I'm making the best decision based on the evidence if the evidence is not always transparent. What I can't control is I'm the only one interpreting this evidence. Oh, we're all busy. I didn't, no one else had time to go look at the stats this week. Okay, well, then I guess you have to listen to what my interpretation is. That's a different problem. That's a different problem. But if the problem is I'm controlling these and throwing out all the outliers and trying to craft, you know, there's some, there's some maliciousness. Malicious? Is that a real word? Involved. Like, that. that's a different situation, but I have certainly seen it. Oh, definitely. This. There's been plenty of evidence out there of malicious intent or malice of forethought yeah yes. for sure especially if you're going against a competitor and your numbers don't look as good right right yeah yeah that's games at that point and that doesn't help us like as a business that doesn't help us at all if you're involved in playing these games we always uh, recommend you keep your resume updated because you <laughs> never know what's going to happen here. well i mean that that you might be playing these games because you're in a culture where you have to keep your resume updated you might be playing these games because you're being told what to do. Well, like, the funny thing is we didn't even talk about this on this podcast. Like in the culture where your boss tells you what to do and then if it doesn't work out because they made they just told you what to do, they didn't they weren't paying attention to evidence or maybe they're not a domain expert or whatever. They just told you what to do and it doesn't work out. And you're now fired. you didn't implement it correctly and you didn't yeah, do something geez. like that. Yeah. yeah, we didn't even go into like the, the all the negative scenarios that I mean, I'm kind of glad we didn't do that because it would have been I honestly I feel Everything we talked about was in a much more positive light rather than situations like that. They're just like obviously negative and you really don't need we to We can be. roll that into a culture podcast that we maybe we'll do one day. We should. We got to give people value for every penny they didn't pay for oh, this podcast. Well, well then <laughs> in that case, I'm glad you enjoyed this podcast and uh, like and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for being here. Thank Thanks for having me, guys.